Welcome to Taking the Leap into Commercial Real Estate, the number one podcast dedicated to helping you get comfortable in the commercial real estate arena and equipping you with the latest market news, insights, and strategies you need to make informed decisions about investing. Now, let's get into today's episode with your host, Angel and Brittany Gonzalez and John Jerry. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for making it back to Taking a Leap into Commercial Real Estate. Uh, we are honored here to have our guest, Greg Hebner, with us. I also have my co-host, Brittany Gonzalez and Jen Gary with us. And we just want to get right into it. So, uh, Greg, for starters, Kat, can you please introduce yourself and uh, describe what it is that you do? Yeah, everybody. Um, my name is Greg Hebner. I run Ethos Capital Ventures with my uh, business partner, James Gregg. And we help real estate professionals and investors unlock predictable results and um, outsized returns through their investments opportunities um, while utilizing real estate as a core asset and utilizing all the great tax advantages that come with owning real estate. Wow. I, how how did you get started into this? What what drew yeah. you here? Explain more. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's probably a very typical path, honestly. Um, my father's always owned rental, rental properties. Um, so I saw him grow up as a landlord and everything. Um, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And um, I think there's another book out there. It's not how much you make, but how much you keep, really focusing on a lot of the tax advantages out there um, that the IRS gives you. Um, I, I, uh, one of the groups that I kind of follow, they subscribe to the axiom that the IRS actually gives you the playbook. And so in a, a lot of real estate, you know, you're focused on being an adversary to the IRS or there's an adversarial nature. I'm actually at the point where I actually want to partner with them and because uh, they give me the rules. Now, it's, it's written in a really arcane language and you have to kind of unpack it and figure it out. But at the same point in time, they give you uh, they give you the playbook. And being a sports person, I enjoy having the playbook, but sometimes you have to also call audibles and everything like that as well. Well, that's great information, Greg. So, I mean, first of all, how long have you guys been doing this? And then can you kind of elaborate on some significant milestones that you guys have hit along the way? Yeah. So I've been investing since 2004. I was uh, still a student in college when I bought my first rental property. Um, uh, that one was actually a duplex. So I always had this approach where I never wanted to have a vacancy. I always wanted to have some income coming in. And so I, I didn't buy my first single family house until 2020. So 16 years later is when I bought my first single family house and I rented, rented it to a nonprofit and they've had a hundred percent occupancy or they paid me, um, every day and I haven't had any turnover or anything like that. Um, so I, I always took that approach in whatever I did as well as being able to maximize revenue per square foot. So that's really been my bread and butter throughout time is taking larger properties and actually converting them into individual units, um, per se, creating duplexes, creating um, triplexes and, and that sort of thing. Um, that's kind of really how I got started. I was very hands-on doing a lot of the work, eventually decided that wasn't for me, actually kind of burned myself out doing a construction job on the side as well. Um, and, uh, did, uh, did a W2 job, got a computer science degree, did that for about 12 years. Um, half the time in the U S half the time in Australia as well. Um, as we developed the APAC, um, Asia Pacific and Japan region there, uh, eventually just kind of got tired of that and came back into real estate full time in 2019. Um, I had started doing some projects and James and I had kind of crossed paths, um, in a couple different real estate groups and in Kansas city, they were doing some multifamily meetups. And I was going to sign in on the form and it's like, that name looks really familiar. That, you know, James Gregg, there's, you know, it just seems very familiar. And so we caught up afterwards. And as they say, the rest is history. We've done a couple projects together and uh, continuing to do business right now. I will get back to the sports thing. I will tell you that, but I, I will, I definitely want to ask you, like, from the standpoint of like the skills and experiences that you use, like, what, what do you think the, the, the important ones that were crucial to your success? What kind of was the driving habit? Yeah, um, I, I played football um, through high school and at a D3 level in college. And uh, as with most sports, you know, there's an individual aspect, but there's also a team aspect of things. Um, even in the wrestling, even in the swimming, you have the team, the team score and you contribute into that team score. So I view real estate as a team sport. Yeah, I did everything myself when I began and that sucked, but it was what it took to get started. 
And you learn along the way, you find you find good contractors, you find the bad ones too, and you learn how to what questions to ask and how to interview and everything. And as I got into the software world as well, you know, I, I we had a team around us. I couldn't deliver a project all by myself. I had to, as a consultant, I had a project manager, I had a manager on the team. We had specialists trades, which would be the equivalent of the of the HVAC, the plumbing, electrical, and the real estate world. Um, and so you really had to work within a team. And so I've always been that team dynamic. I really don't, even if we were going after the same deal, I don't feel that as competing. It's just, it's just, it just is what it is. I can go up to this price point. You can go up to that price point, And that's, and the seller makes the choice, whether they choose price or terms or whatever. And I think that's just really the nice benefit is that we can all do this real estate thing together and not having to be adversary at the end of the day, adversarial at the end of the day. So I think it's really, um, I think it's really great from that perspective. And so the skill sets around that are really based on team trying to figure out what you do really well, what you can do, but you don't do so well, or you prefer not to do, and then finding the complementary partner um, to take our partners to take on the other roles there. And that's where James and I really have found ourselves to work well together. Um, I needed a capital capital partner initially. I knew we had some capital when we bought our first 29 unit building together. But now what's come out of that four years later is that we're a, we're yin and yang. You know, I'm the visionary, I'm the guy that's pulling us up and telling us that we need to kind of go after this type of thing and and here's our goals and here's our objectives. And James is just like, "Hey, maybe we do that, but we do it from this angle here and kind of pulls us back down a little bit." And like I can't envision crafting a better job description for a business partner than what I found with James. Wow, that's awesome to hear. <laughs> I say it's very fortunate when you're able to find partners that can complement you, right? And it continue is. to use each other. That's awesome. Yes, it is. So you kind of shared how you evolved a little bit from being a person that did it individually to creating and having a team or a partner. But how would you say the field that you're in has evolved? Or how do you say it's changed since you started to where we are today? Yeah, and that's a that's a really good question because I didn't know what I didn't know back then. And when I started doing real estate, it was a, it was in a town of eight thousand people, and and w- while we had the um, the the economic situation that happened in two thousand seven, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, uh, and everything like that, like like my like the properties in our area never really appreciated a whole lot, and so we didn't have that great decline there either. They were just good cash flowing properties. So so I didn't really understand the magnitude of that until much later. When I was working at the software company and they started doing layoffs in the 2009, 2010 world, it's like, oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, here I am collecting cash flow from a small little portfolio. I've been working at a, at a software tech job for, for a couple of years now. And just like, huh, why, why are there not people around anymore? You know? And so from, from that dynamic, I really understood that there's actually some cycles that come into play. All right, throughout time. So history never really repeats, but it rhymes more frequently than what it doesn't. And so what was really interesting is then in 2014, when I was in Australia, I actually um, found a gentleman, read his book, and that book changed my entire dynamic of why I wanted to do real estate from the focus on the tax advantages and the cash flow perspectives to that actually there's different times and periods and seasons in the market cycles, when to hold, when to buy, uh, when to sell real estate. And that approach just really transformed my life a lot in the 2014 era. I love that. Yeah. Understanding market cycles is huge. Um, you know, And I love your point too about just the IRS really kind of giving you the playbook on how to do things. You know, at, at the end of the day, though, we're at heart, we're all entrepreneurs, right? And and there's no real playbook for that. So what I'd like to know is, you know, have you had any impactful relationships along the way, any mentors that have kind of guided you through the process? Because it's a hard field to kind of learn, you know, you really have to get out there in the real world and experience things. Yeah, it's lonely. I mean, it's it's, yeah. it's really lonely doing it. Um, It's, I mean, I... I, lo- I learned a lot what to do from my dad. I also learned a lot what not to do. So my dad is, a, is the very traditional landlord. Still to this day, 
mid seventies and everything. And when I got back into real estate in 2019, I uh, more more active than what I had been at that time. I realized that I did not want to be a landlord. I, I just so I I I cut myself off from that perspective. Okay, so that's when I really started building a team around me as I started adding rental properties into the mix. So that was really one of the big changes in my life was actually me being a mentor to myself at that point in time. Um, James obviously has helped a, a lot. We've had a lot of deep conversations. Um, and that's what a real true business partner can do. You can open up about those things. Um, I've, I've been part of some uh, uh, groups and everything like that over time as well. Um, um, I actually worked for Michael Blanc back in the day, uh, 2017, 2018 period for quite a bit. Um, and, and that really helped me understand a lot of the financial aspects, especially with the SDA and, and his module out there for underwriting. And the, probably the more fundamental change most recently has probably been probably Hunter Thompson and just understanding marketing and, and in mass and, and at a very particular level. Um, he runs a program just helping individuals raise capital, but it's really a marketing course. Um, which is very ironic because you know he's telling you what you want to hear and he's giving you what you actually need, which is marketing 101. And um, so you know that's been a really powerful uh, message there. Um, so I think a, a mentor you can also have just to kind of summarize, you can mentor, you can have somebody that you appeal up to that you want to be like, but you can also, again, you got to internalize deeply like, hey, what do you not want to do anymore? And you got to ask yourself that. Like, where do you draw the floor at in your life in terms of what you're willing to do? And I actually drew the floor um, the last time that I did any renovations to my properties was um, mid-2021. The last real renovation I work I did was um, the last half of 2021 when I uh, we remodeled our own family home um, and everything like that. Otherwise, I haven't done anything else to my properties. I don't carry tools in my in my bat, you know, in my vehicle anymore or anything like that. Like, nope, it's all the team doing the work. And so you just have to kind of cut yourself off at some point in time too and 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 respect that and be true to yourself when you make those commitments. I always say it's hard sometimes when you're in it that to let somebody else take control, right? Where it's yeah. like, okay, you can do that now. Uh, I don't know if I can. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well um, it's it's elevating their their capabilities you know, delegate to elevate them. And and then that's how you get the whole team to buy into what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, definitely empower them, right? That's yeah. key. <laughs> well, as you talked about it, what are some of the valuable lessons that you've learned along the way that helped you to navigate? I don't know if we have enough time for that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Geez, valuable lessons. I, I mean, I, th I think it is, you know, again, entrepreneurship is lonely. Yeah. So you need to make sure that you have time to reflect. You just you just have to have time to reflect on what's working, what's not working, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I, some people call it journaling. Some people call it going for a walk. You know, but you have to really understand what you um, what went right and also what went wrong. You have to understand that. Okay, so I think that's really step one. The other lessons learned are actually what what. what could constitute a good partnership versus not a good partnership. And, and I haven't, I've had some bad partnerships too. And that is just kind of what it is. And so um, I think being able to actually being able to have those bad partnerships, I think are really um, powerful. But at the same point in time, um, trying to think about what you really want out of a partnership and then seeking that out. And I think that's really a, a good lesson to. And, and, you know, James and I are still teasing things out after four years. Like we're still trying to figure out how, how to work best together since we've, since we've changed over those last four years. We're really trying to figure out how we work well together and then add team members into our realm as well. Um, I think another thing is, is just being a constant lear learner, just learning things and not just in the real estate space, but just learning, learning about different things. Um, I I enjoy law. I I enjoy I think I think law school would be a fantastic activity for me to partake in. I have no desire to be a lawyer. 
So I'm not going to go to law school, but I can also read contracts really well. I can create contracts. I can, you know, negotiate terms really well and things like that. And that's proven extremely beneficial for me at the end of the day. And so I think, you know, having outside skill sets that you can pull into the real estate space are really, really, really powerful as well. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other really key. I mean, those are the, those, those two, three, three items are things that I keep coming back to on a repetitive basis. And um, another skill set actually is asking yourself better questions. Just asking yourself better questions. And that's, and that's tough. And that's really tough. I was going to say, you made a mention of bad partners. I'm going to say, we're going to have to get a list of people we don't want to partner with in the future. It's not very long. It's not very long. <laughs> All right, great, no, we're starting now. <laughs> <Good. laughs> yeah. I, and I kind of draw upon the time to reflect. You know, I think that's an important thing to factor into your schedule. I, all too often, I find myself with my time to reflect at 12 p.m. as I'm laying my head on the pillow and, you know, can't go to sleep. You know, and that's, that's not the right way. Um, you've been doing it's, this for a long time, it's Greg. It's not terrible. It's not terrible. Um, it's 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 good to get it out of your head. Actually, it's really sure. good to get it out of your head. So I think that's I think I think just doing the activity is step one, and then figuring out when you're most impactful at performing that activity is step two. Absolutely, great point. So you've been doing this for a while. Can you share any memorable projects that you've had or successful outcomes that you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, honestly, probably my my best. Uh, my best one was probably, well, it was probably my best one. But the one that really uh, has stood the test of time was my first one. Um, and I held that for 18 years. Uh, it never really appreciated a whole lot, but it, it just spat off cash flow. It was a three unit um, converted residence. It just spat off cash flow. And it was very, very, very easy to manage at the end of the day. Um, we, we went into... Uh, some properties in the 2019 time frame, uh, expecting them to be long-term hold cash flow deals. And then the situations unfolded before us where appreciation kind of took hold. And that's just where we had to, we had to end up calling it a win, even though it didn't match our original game plan. We had to call it a win when we still made money and made a decent amount of money for, for ourselves and for our, for our investors. And so I think just I think just being able to understand that, hey, the game can change over time and recognizing that, hey, when you got to win, you got to win and you need to you need to do that. Um, you need to take you need to take your money off the table to some degree. Yeah, you absolutely do. I, I got to tell you that that's sometimes the hardest one that I see sometimes is how do you take that off? You know, because you're like, do I keep it running, not keep it running? So I've been yep. there. Yeah, I did. They um. I, I I haven't been able to refine this article, but here's a little tidbit. And, and I found this probably 10, 12 years ago. And it was focused on real estate, but you can apply it to anything in life in that at the end of the year, when you do like an end of year review, which number one, do an end of year review. Number two, assess whether or not you would continue to own this asset. And that's that could be real estate, that could be a stock, that could be an article of clothing if you want to do Marie Kondo style on it. Or, or something like that, like just really understanding and and would you rebuy this property now, given where it's at? And if the answer is no, then why are you still holding it? <laughs> oh, that's a great point. Great question. That's, that's yeah. a really good point. Yeah, yeah I, I know we we I, I didn't want to get a little bit into Australia. So you said because I'm I'm that way. I've been all over the place. What? So were you brought to Australia for work, or what was that all about? Yeah. Yeah, um, the software company I was with got acquired by a big multinational company and they wanted to expand. We utilized their existing infrastructure um, for, for building footprints and everything like that. And so um, I went over as the professional services delivery person on the team and a gentleman from the UK came over from the sales side of, for the sales side of things. And we cowboyed around um, Asia Pacific for a couple of years, got some traction going build a team there. And I was there for about a total of six years. Wow. I, the, only, the only thing I will tell you is I, I, I love, I, I've always thought about Australia, but I always think about the fact that I don't like being places where I think my life is in danger constantly. So I'm having a really hard time visiting. So <laughs> we had, uh, 
we had a gentleman come over. He was on our financial analyst team in our in our delivery department, in our professional services department. He was so deathly afraid of snakes and spiders and everything like that. It was it was it was awesome to see him just literally sweat almost every day on that stuff. I I I, I enjoy Patrick. He's a great great human being and everything. But um, yeah, it's it's unless you really get out in the wilderness, like you know, we've pushed they pushed a lot of the uh, wilderness out of the city and everything. There's not really that much of an issue anymore. Okay, well, I know I'm like I have to say something. I know Brady's got her her, her question, but I was just like, eh, I gotta figure out this is I don't know. I don't know about that. So, yeah, no, it was a really fun time. I mean, I grew up. My my wife and I grew up very very much uh, personally, just raising kids and everything. We went over with a two year old and a two month old. Um, came back with a seven five and three year old, and then you know I had to work. I had to grow up very very prof- a lot professionally as well. And and Jamie, the salesperson that moved over with us, I, I learned a lot about sales from him. Um, he he's a, he's a dear friend to me. I just met up with him again when we were back there in July um, in Australia, and and like you know, we just we just kicked things off. I got goosebumps right now. We got we kicked things off, you know, just like we hadn't not seen each other for like six years and and everything. So no, I it's a, it's a huge 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 part of our life right now, and and I'm very grateful for the experience. Well, you kind of brought me right into the next question. You talked a little bit about family. So one thing that I like to ask all of our guests, um, Greg, is our company's motto is faith, family, and giving. And so those are three things that resonate resonate really strongly within us. Um, Can you share how one of those um, areas impact you in your life? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, family right now is probably uh, first and foremost. Um, We've got a 14-year-old, 12-year-old, and 10-year-old daughters. And... uh, Great, great time. Um, they're all super active in a bunch of different activities, way too much. And there's three of them and there's only two of us. And so like we're always spread thin. Um, and but the I, honestly, like the most impactful thing right now regarding family is is my 14 year old and I. And we've had a, a change in our relationship like last two, two weeks or so even. Um, she's always kind of be distant, been distant. She's always been the one that I've, I've struggled to kind of really build a connection with, but she's getting, she's learning how to drive. She wants to learn how to drive right now. We've had a couple lessons and it's really been, um, very, very interesting having conversations with her because if you believe in the axiom that the, when the, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Well, I've been preaching for about 14 years and the student's now ready. And so now I've been able to teach. And so we had a, we had a situation. It's really funny. Um, she needed some help with some science homework and everything like that. And, and kind of at the end of it, this has happened this past weekend. At the end of it, she mentioned that, um, you know, that this really helped her a lot and everything like that. Well, I was just like, Hey, I've been telling you these things for 14 years, you know? It's just that you haven't been ready to receive them. And so I've had to elaborate more because I didn't know, you know, how how much you'd be able to learn from all these uh all this stuff I've been putting out there to you. It's like, all right, I get it now. And like it's just been fantastic. So I've been riding that high for like the last two weeks or so. It's been fantastic. So family, family over everything. Um, my father always says, I can't remember where he got it, FOE. Um, I think one of the KU basketball players actually had it on their arm. Um, um, I can't remember their name right now. I can picture them, but you know, family over everything. Absolutely. 100%. I, I got to say, we're in the same boat with three girls. So you're giving me a, something to look forward to as they get older. Um, ours are two, one and zero. So okay. it'll be definitely interesting as they continue to grow. <laughs> it's been a fun And I have a 15 year old who's also driving. That is the best time to connect. I love it. Let's completely yeah. appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Hey, well, Greg, I got to tell you, man, it's been, uh, it's awesome that you're able to kind of share that with us. I, I want to, I always have to make sure that we are able to uh, ask every guest is uh, if we want to learn more and get to know you more, where can we, our guests find you? Can you tell us a little about your company and, and so forth? Yeah. Um, just really quick, you know, um, obviously, uh, you know, via this podcast and everything like that, um, uh, my website is ethos CV, uh, uh, ethos capital ventures, ethos, uh, capital, uh, C for capital, V for ventures.com. Um, um, we've got a nice little uh, uh, giveaway if, if somebody wants to go to ethoscv.com slash taking the leap. Uh, you can go out to that website there and download um, a little freebie out there just to help add value to the community. Awesome. Man, 
I, I got to tell you, I appreciate that. But I'll re- as girl dad, you, don't be shocked if I reach out to you, okay? Because I got three girls. They're really young. I got three under three. So I'm like, wait a minute. Whenever I see more girl dads, I got to make sure I, I keep them in my role decks. <laughs> Hashtag girl dad or whatever they do. I don't know how they do that. But anyway, <laughs> so. No, so, I mean, I was always I was always the dad when they were younger. I was throwing the kids up in the air. I had I had two brothers. Like, I knew no different. And so my, my girls were flying and... I, I save their life every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's awesome, man. Well, I, again, thank you so much for hopping on with us, and we'll be definitely catching up soon, man. Absolutely. Okay. Pleasure. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you for joining us on the Taking the Leap into Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment to support us by subscribing and leaving a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And remember, the views and content shared on this podcast do not reflect that of Keystone Private Capital and Keystone Holdings. Creative Planning, LLC, Bergen KDV, Creative Planning, and Keystone Private Capital and Keystone Holdings are separate and distinct companies. Creative Planning is not affiliated with Keystone Private Capital, Keystone Holdings, or any of their affiliated companies and makes no claims, promises, or endorsements of any products offered by Keystone Private Capital and Keystone Holdings. Our views are our own and not those of Creative Planning. Thank you for tuning in and we'll catch you in the next episode.